as they continue to make their way out, I invite you to turn with me to Psalm 16, if you haven't done so already. Psalm 16 this morning. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As I'm sure we're all aware, these are the words of the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson in 1776. Yourdictionary.com says that the pursuit of happiness is defined as a fundamental right mentioned in the Declaration of Independence to freely pursue joy and live life in a way that makes you happy. Now, whether or not Thomas Jefferson ever penned these words or not, the reality is that all of us are in pursuit of happiness. We're in pursuit of pleasure, of satisfaction, of joy. Every person throughout history, every person alive today is in pursuit of happiness. Blaise Pascal put it this way, All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. Happiness is what we are all in pursuit of. And yet in a world today which seems to offer any and every means of happiness, more happiness, more means of happiness, the world would say, than any time in history, what do we find? We find that of all societies, we are really the most miserable of all time, the most depressed, the most discouraged. How can this be? Some might say that pursuing happiness in and of itself is a wrong motivation. It's a wrong pursuit. They would say it's just about denying self. And while that's true to a degree, as we've already said, the reality is we all pursue happiness. We all pursue uh, doing what makes us happy, what brings us pleasure, what brings us joy or satisfaction. So I believe the pursuit of happiness then is not wrong in and of itself, but it's the reality that what we're looking to for happiness many times is wrong. We're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Pascal continues, There once was in man a true happiness, of which now remain to him only the mark of empty trace, which he in vain tries to fill from all his surroundings. But these are all inadequate. Because the infinite abyss can only be filled by an infinite and immutable object. That is to say, only by God himself. In our pursuit of happiness, what we do is we try to fill that infinite void that all of us has with things that are finite, things that are temporary. And they may bring a little bit of happiness, a little bit of joy, but it is fast fleeting. It can never fully satisfy that infinite longing of our heart. I love what C.S. Lewis said about this. He said, we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. As we come to our passage this morning in Psalm 16, I want us to see where true and lasting happiness comes from so that we can truly pursue it. Not pursue it in the wrong places, but pursue it where it can be found, where true happiness, where true joy, true satisfaction of the soul can be found. So let's turn our attention to Psalm 16 as we think about this idea of pursuing happiness. Psalm 16, a miktam of David. David writes, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. 
The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray that God would stir our hearts with his word this morning. Father, I thank you for this passage, this desire of David to look to you, to find his delight, to find his happiness in pursuing you. And God, I pray you would use this passage to stir our hearts, to stir our affections, our desire for you, to see that compared to you, nothing in life truly can satisfy, nothing can bring happiness. So God, challenge our hearts today, challenge our minds, and help us to leave here in pursuit of you, in pursuit of your glory, and the satisfaction that is found in that pursuit. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So come to Psalm 16. You'll notice most of your Bibles probably have that heading, a miktam of David. There's a lot of uncertainty as to what that word miktam means. Some think it's just simply a musical term. Others maybe just a, a meaning of a writing. It's a writing of David. This is the same heading actually found in Psalms 56 through 60 as well. But others think that this means a golden psalm or a secret psalm. Whether or not that's the true meaning, what we find in Psalm 16 is a golden or secret means to which David finds that lasting satisfaction, that lasting happiness. Here we see a man after God's own heart showing us where that pursuit of happiness can be found. So as we examine this psalm, I want us to see three truths about God that help us understand where lasting satisfaction comes from so that we can truly pursue happiness with our lives. First of all, we see the reality in verses 1 through 3 that God is our provider. David begins the psalm, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. David recognizes uh, God is his refuge. He cries out to him to preserve him. We don't know the historical context of this psalm, but if you're familiar with David's life, you know there were many times in his life where he faced persecution, pressure, enemies coming against him. In many of his psalms, this is the cry of his heart. Preserve me. And so we see him crying out to God, preserve me or watch over me, guard me. He acknowledges that God is his refuge, the thing that he can run to. He can run to God to find security, to find safety in those times of trouble. Where is our security found today? Many seek to find security in uh, their job, maybe in uh, how much money they have in the bank, maybe if their political party's in power or not. Maybe you find security in another person that you cling to. And while those may provide a level of security, our ultimate security has to be found in God and through Christ. If we are in Christ, then God is our refuge, just like it was, He was for David. And He is the one that in the times of trouble of our life, when the world would steal our joy, would steal our happiness, we can run to and find that safety and security. Where is it that we run when troubles and trials of life come? Do we find ourselves running to God in those times, crying out as David did, preserve me? Or do we find ourselves in those times of trouble running away from God's presence? David acknowledges that God is his refuge. In him, he's the provider of security. But look at verse 2. We see David recognizes God provides sovereignty over his life. Verse 2 
He says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Here in our English translation, we see the same word, Lord. Uh, in, in, it says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. It's the same English word. However, in your English versions, what you'll probably find is that that first Lord is in all caps, whereas the second Lord, the L is capitalized, but the other letters are lowercase. This is meant to show that there are different Hebrew words being used, different names of God here. The capital, all caps, Lord, anytime you find that uh, in your English version, is the proper name of God, Yahweh. The second Lord is the name Adonai, which means master. So what David is here saying is, I say to Yahweh, you are my master. And as his master, God is sovereign. He leads him. He guides him. David is saying, you are my Lord. You are my master. I will follow you. I will go where you lead. If God were a cruel master, then David would experience hurt and heartache. But because God is a good master, he says, I have no good apart from you. Anything good in life that David experienced, he recognized that God was the source of that good. Can you say this morning that, da that God is your master, that he is the one to whom you will follow, the one to whom you will obey? We see again, God is the source of all good things. We can find nothing in life good that doesn't come directly from the hand of our good God. James 1.17 says this, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Anything good in life comes from our sovereign Lord, who is a good master, worthy of our praise and of our life's pursuits. We see here in verse 3 as well, David acknowledges the community that God provides to him as well. He says, as for the saints in the land... They are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Here David acknowledges the fellow saints, fellow believers who are focused on pursuing God. And he says, when he uses that word saints, it simply means holy ones. Those made holy by God, those set apart to serve the Lord. He reflects on the provision that fellow believers are. And as we think about this in our life today, we know that... If we're to pursue God and to pursue happiness in God, satisfaction of God, we need others in our lives who have that same focus so that in those times of struggle, those times of temptation, you, you've been there. You've had that person come alongside you who's focused on the Lord and can help you to keep your focus on Him, keep your pursuit upon Him. So David acknowledges these saints that God has to keep him in pursuit of the Lord, to encourage him. Do you have those believers in your life that are in that encouragement, that source of spiritual strength to help you in those times where you're focused on yourself, or you're focused on what you're going through, they can re redirect you to the Lord? Do you seek to be that encouragement to others as well? To come alongside of believers who may be struggling and to point them to the Lord? As we seek to pursue happiness, we desperately need others to come alongside of us that have the same pursuit of the Lord that can help and encourage us in those times of struggle. So we see here, in this pursuit of happiness, we have to realize God is our provider. Secondly, in verses 4 through 8, I want us to see that God is our portion. David contrasts with verse 3, the saints in the land, those whom he delights in, with verse 4, those who are following after other gods. He says in verse 4, The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. Again, we see this contrast between those who are pursuing God and those who are pursuing other gods, false gods. David determines that he's not going to participate in this false worship. He's not going to pour out drink offerings to them. He's not even going to take these false gods upon his lips. It's easy for us to see some of these Old Testament passages and to think that idolatry is a thing of the past or idolatry is something that people only struggle with in, in countries like India where there's multiple gods and they are making idols out of wood or stone or metal. But the reality is we all face the struggle of idols in our lives. 
Someone once said our hearts are like idol factories, that we just create an idol out of anything. An idol is anything we place above God and anything that we seek to find our satisfaction and our joy in. If you're wondering maybe what is that idol in my life that I struggle with, well, I think as we answer the following question, we can be made aware to what those idols are in our life. Think of this question. What is it in your life that you think, if I could just have this or be this or do this, I would be happy? What is it? All of us probably have a different answer. What is it in your life that you think, if I could just have this or be this or do this, then I would finally be happy? The answer to this question may reveal what it is we are worshiping, what God we are running after. We may think, if I could just have that job or that promotion, or if I could just get this amount of money, or maybe it's another possession like a a car, if I could have that car, that house, I would be happy. Maybe it's a relationship with another person. We think, if I could just have a relationship with them, or if I had that perfect family structure, then I would finally be happy. Maybe you think it's a position of power. Or maybe, as a lot of our world is thinking today, it's found in how we identify outwardly. You think of the LGBTQ plus however many letters there are now. The focus is true happiness is in identifying with what you feel inwardly. But what, what do you find in all these pursuits? When those become our ultimate pursuit, some of these things aren't bad things. It's not bad to desire a good job or desire money or desire certain things in life relationships with people but when we make them the source of our ultimate satisfaction they cannot live up to that level we will not find satisfaction in them if we make that our heart's pursuit then as david says here we're running after other gods we will not find happiness in that pursuit instead we'll find as david says sorrow our sorrows will be multiplied we'll run after these things that cannot satisfy that will let us down that cannot fill that void, and they'll leave us more empty and more dry. David's son Solomon wrote a book of the Bible about this very thing. The book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon talks about how he pursued meaning in life, purpose in life, satisfaction in life apart from God, and he says, you know what, I looked everywhere. I looked in pleasure. I didn't hold back from anything pleasurable in life, and what did I find? Emptiness vanity i pursued wealth and riches and what did i find emptiness i pursued relationships i pursued power whatever it is knowledge and what did i find at the end of that pursuit emptiness vanity and solomon concludes the book of ecclesiastes by saying the only thing left is to fear god and keep his commandments the only thing that truly brings satisfaction is knowing god walking with Him, pursuing Him. No matter how we answer the question of what it is that we think will bring us happiness in life, there's one idol that all of us have that is at the center of our answer to that question, and it's the idol of ourselves. Richard Baxter says it this way, Self is the God of wicked men, or the world's greatest idol, and that the inordinate love of pleasure, profits, and honor, and trinity is all but this self-love in unity. Every man is an idolater so far as he is selfish. Now, selfish, ungodly men do all of them rob God and give his honor and prerogatives to themselves. They call him their God, but will not have him for their portion, nor give him the strongest love of their hearts. They will not take him as their absolute owner and devote themselves and all they have to him. They will not take him for their sovereign and be ruled by him, nor deny themselves for him nor seek his honor and interest above their own. They call him their father, but deny him his honor. And they call him their master, but give him not his fear. They depend not on his hand and live not by his law and to his glory. And therefore do not take him for their God. At the heart of all idolatry is our selfishness. It's us saying to ourselves, we know better than God as to what will make us happy. What will bring satisfaction? Proverbs 14, 12 tells us that there is a way 
that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. If you are running after another God, an idol in your life that you think will bring satisfaction, be assured, as David says, your sorrows will multiply. You will not find true and lasting satisfaction in anything other than the true God. And so David shifts his focus in verse 5 and 6. He's focused on those who run after another God, and he's determined, I'm not going to make an offering. I'm not even going to take their name on my lips. Why? Because David has something better. He says in verse 5, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. So David's desire not to partake in idolatry or running after false gods is because God is his portion. He understood the lasting joy and satisfaction that comes from pursuing the Lord. The language here in verses 5 and 6 are an allusion or a metaphor to an allotment of land. When you think about uh, when Israel entered the promised land and different tribes were given different pieces of land, that's the picture here. In fact, in Joshua 14 through 21, we won't turn there this morning because it's several chapters, but if you have time to peek over there, Joshua 14 through 21, what you find is the historical account of, okay, we're going to take in a lot, and this is where uh, your heritage comes from. Here's your portion of the land, you know, tribe of Judah, tribe of Reuben, whatever it may be. They would cast lots, maybe very similar to us rolling dice. So it'd be like, okay, you got number six, so here's your land. Here's the boundaries of the land that is your portion, that is your inheritance. <clears throat> this is the picture that David is recounting here, is that division of land. And if you go to Joshua 14 through 21, what you find are very specific details as to the boundaries of this land. It'll say, you know, okay, your land extends to this river and up to this mountain and over to this plain or whatever it may be. And so depending on how the lot fell, this is your portion of land. But one tribe received a very different inheritance than the rest. This is actually prior to Joshua in Numbers 18.20. It says, The Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. And then God says this, I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. Here, David uses this similar imagery. God is his portion. God is his inheritance. He's the cup of blessing. And as God acknowledges that he gets God himself, he gets a relationship with God, he acknowledges God's sovereignty again. You hold my lot. Whatever happens in life, Lord, you are sovereign over it. You control that. When you think of last week, we sung the song, It Is Well. And there's a line in that song that says, Whatever my lot... You have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When you think of the author of that hymn, Horatio Spafford, you realize that that song was written at a great loss to him. He had lost his children, several of his children in a ship accident. And yet he can say it as well. Why? Because God is his portion. No matter what comes in life, good or bad, if we have God, we have more than enough. And this is what David acknowledges here, that God is his portion, that God holds his lot in life. And because God is his portion, what he says is the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Picture yourself as one of the people of Israel when the land was being divided up. And, you know, let's say the lot fell and, okay, here's your land. And you're thinking, oh, great, I get really nice. There's some really nice trees there and there's a nice lake and a nice mountain, and there's lots of farmland, and oh man, that's a, great, that's a great portion that I got. Or maybe to the contrary, the lot is rolled, and you go, man, this is a terrible piece of land, right? There's no water source, the land is barren, whatever it may be. The truth is, when it comes to God, if we have God, no matter what comes in life, we can say like David, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. No matter the trials or circumstances of life, if we are making God our pursuit, if we have a relationship with Him, we can say that. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. 
We can say, like the psalmist in Psalm 73, Asaph wrote Psalm 73, and he says a very similar thing to David. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. No matter what comes in life, if God is our portion, we have enough. We can be satisfied in knowing Him. Is He your portion and your cup today? David acknowledges that He's His portion, but uh, verses 7 through 8, we actually see an aspect of this, that God is His counselor. He says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Here David acknowledges that as His Sovereign as his master, he is going to take counsel from God. God is the one to whom he can receive that counsel, that guidance in life, that direction. He meditates on the goodness of God and the satisfaction that comes from knowing him. In verse 7 and later on in verse 8 or verse 9, that word heart is literally the word kidneys. In David's day and age, this was the, considered the seat of the emotions. And so what David says is, There's an emotional aspect that when we understand who God is, we cannot help but respond with our heart, with our emotions. So we see that his heart is instructing him in the night. He's meditating upon the goodness of God. He seeks to make the Lord his life's pursuit. And as long as it says in verse 8 that the Lord is before him, he will not be shaken. He will not be swayed. No matter what comes in life, if he's focused on the Lord, that pursuit continues. If we would pursue happiness, we must pursue the Lord and heed the counsel that He gives us through His Word. Instead of doing things our way, instead of thinking that we know best as to what brings us happiness and satisfaction, we must be submissive to what God's Word says. And in that, we find true and lasting satisfaction. As long as we keep Him before us, our focus, as our focus, we can say like David did, that we will not be shaken. We will not be swayed. So we see that to pursue happiness, we have to realize God is our provider. He's our portion. But lastly, in verses 9 through 11, I want us to see that God is our pleasure. God is our pleasure. Look at verses 9 through 11 again. David's response to reflecting on all that God is leads him to say in verse 9, Therefore, my heart is glad My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David's response there to all that God is to him leads him to complete and utter worship. With his whole being. He says, my whole being rejoices. Every part of me. I think this is a picture, a great picture of what true worship is. Worship is not just an intellectual exercise where we understand in our mind. It's not purely emotional where we just have an emotive response to who God is. It includes our intellect. It includes our emotion. And it includes our will, our volition. As we seek to obey what God says. As we seek to pursue him more. True worship involves every aspect of our being, and that's what we see here in David. His whole being is rejoicing in who God is and that he has God as his personal God, that he is his Lord, his master. When we rightly understand what David did and make the Lord our pursuit, we cannot help but worship and rejoice in the Lord. This week is Thanksgiving week. And I know we take a lot of time, as we should, to think of all the blessings we have in God and to rejoice and to thank Him for them. But may we not just be thankful for what God has provided in His good gifts, but may we be thankful for Him. The fact that we know Him, the fact that we have a relationship with Him through Jesus' death and resurrection for us. And as we reflect on who God is, may it lead us to rejoice with our whole being, to worship Him with our mind, with our heart, And with our will. In verse 10, we see here David says, The end of verse 9, My flesh dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your holy one see corruption. 
I do believe there's an element of this verse that applies to David as he looked forward to the ultimate resurrection that is found in God, that he knew the promises of God to him specifically, that God would give him a descendant who would sit upon his throne forever, that he would bring upon a king that would not die, would not be succeeded by another king, but that would set up and establish David's throne forever. And so while David may not have seen the full picture, he has hope here of that future resurrection. But we cannot look at this verse, verse 10, apart from the way Peter and Paul interpret this verse in the book of Acts. In Acts 2, 24 to 32, we see Peter on the day of Pentecost referencing this scripture. It's a little bit of a lengthier passage, so instead I want to take us to Acts 13, 35 to 37. And we see Paul interpreting this passage in light of the resurrection of Christ. In Acts 13, 35 to 37, Paul speaking there says, Therefore he says also in another psalm, You will not let your Holy One see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. In other words, what Paul says is that David, this, these words cannot ultimately apply to David because David died and his body was corrupted in the grave. But Paul says the one to whom God raised up, Jesus, did not see corruption. So while there's an element of, to which David can apply these words to himself and trusting that one day there will be a future resurrection, these words are ultimately prophetic of Jesus and his resurrection and the provision of Jesus' death to pay the penalty of our sins and his resurrection so that those who are made holy, not by our own works, but by faith in what Christ has done, those who are declared holy, made holy, can experience life eternal. And so we can look at this verse and we can, if we're looking back, David, of course, looked forward to the resurrection coming. We look back to it in history. We can claim these words for ourselves that God will not abandon our soul. To Sheol. He will not let his holy ones see corruption. If we are indeed in Christ, we've trusted him by faith and been declared righteous, not because of our righteousness, but because of Jesus' righteousness for us. And so we can rejoice in the beauty of the gospel we see here in verse 10 of that life that we can have, that we have the future hope of eternal joy, of eternal satisfaction. We come to verse 11, and David wraps up this passage, this psalm for us. And he says this in verse 11, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David closes out the psalm by continuing to rejoice, continuing to praise the Lord, because he's made known to David the path of life. I don't think this is just talking about future eternal life, but the life that we as believers can have here and now. Right? It's not just a quantity of life that is given to us who trust Christ, but a quality of life. When we truly make God our pursuit, we truly do that for which we were created. And we really experience true life, which is meant to be lived for God's glory, knowing Him, making Him known to others. And so we see that this is the path of life. This is the path that leads to true and lasting satisfaction in the Lord. We see here, he also mentions that in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. In other words, in God's presence, there is no joy found to be lacking. It's not as though we get to God's presence and we go, well, it's not what I hoped for. It's not what I longed for. No, in God's presence, there is fullness, completeness of joy. At his right hand, it says there are pleasures forevermore. Now, I remember as a teenager in youth group, and I don't know if our youth pastor was speaking on this passage or what he was talking about, but I remember very clearly, you probably know how it is as a teenager. Sometimes you hear some things that are said, sometimes they slip over your head. But everybody heard these words that our youth pastor said, okay? Might have been the only words they heard, but he said this in the middle of his message. He said, sin is fun. And he paused, and I think all of us were going, did he just say what I think he said? Sin is fun? Isn't a youth pastor supposed to say sin's not fun? Sin is bad. 
And he paused for a moment, and then he continued. Sin is fun, but it's only fun for a season. It doesn't last. We see this reality in Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. Another person who pursued the Lord and pursued true and lasting satisfaction in him. It says in Hebrews 11, that famous faith chapter, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. What a beautiful picture of what a pursuit of happiness is meant to be. That Moses would say, you know what? Forget being in this position of being Pharaoh's uh, son. Forget being in this position of great treasure, of great riches. Those are nothing compared to the surpassing worth of following God, of knowing Him. Even if I have to suffer for God's sake, it is worth it because that treasure is so much more than the fleeting pleasures of sin. There is pleasure in sin, but it is short-lived. It leaves us empty and unsatisfied. It's kind of like that old State Farm commercial. I'm sure you've all seen it where... The two ladies are shopping, and the one lady is thinking about getting a purse, and she says, you know, state, she sings the song, you know, State Farm, get me some money, or how much did I save? And so they said, you saved this much money? Okay, I'm going to get the bag. And then the next lady, she says, well, I don't have State Farm, but insurance, buy me money. And here comes this old man. Roger, I know you know this one. And he's got the fishing pole, and he's like, I got you a dollar, right? And she's trying to snag, oh, oh, got to be quicker than that. You're not, you didn't get it. Almost got it, right? You almost had it. That's the way sin is for us. It holds out there, hey, if you'll just pursue me, you'll be happy. You'll be satisfied. And every time we take the bait, and it leaves us empty and unsatisfied. You've got to be quicker than that. We do it again and again, and maybe this sin we find, okay, there isn't satisfaction, so let me try something else. And we think this will make us happy, and then that doesn't, and we pursue something else. But anything we pursue outside of a relationship with, of knowing God more, of delighting in Him, pursuing His presence, seeking to live our life for His glory, any other pursuit will leave us empty and unsatisfied. Are you pursuing today the pleasures of sin that are fleeting? Or are you pursuing the pleasures of God that are forevermore? You know, sometimes we think that the choice between uh, being an unbeliever and being a believer is there's, it's the choice of pleasure or no pleasure, right? Fun or no fun. We, we constantly think of God as a cosmic killjoy, honestly. And that's not the truth. That's not what we see. Instead, what we see is the choice is not pleasure versus no pleasure. The choice is unlasting, unfulfilling Sin that doesn't last, that only pleases for a season, or pleasures that are forevermore. True and lasting satisfaction in the Lord. Every one of us here today is in the pursuit of happiness. The question is, where are we pursuing that happiness? As we've seen through this passage, there's no lasting happiness in running after idols, only sorrow. We may selfishly think that we know what will satisfy but that path leads us to death. Sin may bring temporary pleasure, but it cannot satisfy the infinite longing of our hearts. Can't help but think of the encounter that Jesus had with the woman at the well. And as he met this woman who throughout her life seemed to be pursuing happiness in any, any means possible. And as she encountered Jesus, Jesus asked her for a drink of water. And then he said this to her. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is what is being offered us today. The living water of Christ, of knowing him, of finding joy and satisfaction in pursuing him. And we have the promise there that if we would drink of this living water, we will never be thirsty again. Jeremiah 2.13 
says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In your pursuit of happiness, are you looking to the living water of Christ? Or are you settling for the broken cisterns of dirty water that cannot satisfy your thirst? They only leave you thirstier. The Westminster Shorter Catechism tells us that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And John Piper says this about that. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Are you satisfied in Him this morning? Through this season of life, and I think we find this for all of us as believers, we find our affections for the Lord sometimes not where they should be, and so we Hopefully that creates in us a longing to turn from whatever sinful way it is and to stir those affections, to, to delight in the Lord. And I've been challenged with that in this season, and I've been reading a book entitled Desiring God by John Piper. And I want to close with a few of his words from that book that help us to understand what it truly means to desire God, to pursue Him. He says this, first of all, the pursuit of joy in God is not optional. It is not an extra that a person might grow into after he comes to faith. Until your heart has hit upon this pursuit, your faith cannot please God. It is not saving faith. Saving faith is the confidence that if you sell all you have and forsake all sinful pleasures, the hidden treasure of holy joy will satisfy your deepest desires. Saving faith is the heartfelt conviction not only that Christ is reliable, but also that He is desirable. It is the confidence that He will come through with His promises and that what He promises is more to be desired than all the world. We read in our call to worship that passage in Matthew as Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field that when a man finds it, he hides it and he goes and he sells everything he has to buy that field. It's that pearl of great value that when that merchant finds, he goes and sells everything he has to gain that treasure. This is what it means to truly understand the treasure of Christ. Piper continues, he says, in conversion we find the hidden treasure of the kingdom of God. We venture all on it. And year after year in the struggles of life, we prove the value of the treasure again and again. And we discover new depths of riches we had never known. And so the joy of faith grows when Christ calls us to a new act of obedience that will cost us some temporal pleasure, we call to mind the surpassing value of following Him. And by faith in His proven worth, we forsake the worldly pleasure. The result? More joy. More faith. Deeper than before. And so we go on from joy to joy and faith to faith. Are you pursuing happiness by pursuing God? I want us to be careful not to think that happiness is the ends and that God is just the means to that. No, God is the ends, right? And we find in Him lasting satisfaction. God is not simply the means to happiness. He is happiness. He's not the means to joy. He is joy. And His presence is fullness of joy. He's not the means to eternal life. He is life. And so may we make Him our pursuit, our desire. Piper says this, In the end, the heart longs not for any of God's good gifts, but for God Himself. To see Him and know Him and be in His presence is the soul's final feast. Beyond this, there is no quest. If we would truly pursue happiness, we must be in pursuit of God by realizing that He's our provider, He's our portion, and that He's our pleasure. I want to close our time by reading this prayer from Richard Baxter, and I pray this is the prayer of our heart. Richard Baxter says this, May the living God, who is the portion and rest of the saints, make these our carnal minds so spiritual and our earthly hearts so heavenly that loving Him and delighting in Him may be the work of our lives. Let's pray. Father, I sincerely pray that is our heart's desire. 
that you would stir in us an affection to know you more, a desire to delight in you. God, I pray if there's anyone here today that this concept seems foreign to find joy, to find satisfaction in you, Lord, the only way that we can truly desire you is if you give us a new heart. So God, I pray today if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, today you would take their heart of stone, a heart that has no desire, no appetite for you, but only an appetite for the things of the world. I pray you would soften that heart, that you would transform that heart of stone to a heart of beating flesh, a heart that would desire you, that would begin that journey of pursuing satisfaction in you. And God, for those of us who do know you, Lord, our hearts are so, are so easily led astray. Lord, I think of the hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. God, we are pulled astray when we don't make you our focus, our pursuit, and we are tempted to look to things of the world to bring us happiness and fulfillment. God, help us today to realize that true and lasting joy, satisfaction, happiness, pleasure is only found in walking with you. May we keep you as our focus so that we can say with David, no matter what life throws with us, if you're at our right hand, we will not be shaken. So God, stir the affections of our heart. Stir our desire for you. Help us to respond as David did with complete and utter worship, rejoicing in who you are and the privilege we have of knowing you. So God, do your work in each of our hearts as you see fit. Draw us to yourself. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.